الحمد لله الحمد لله رب العالمين الحمد لله حمدا كثيرا طيبا مباركا فيه كما يحب ربنا ويرضى يا ربي لك الحمد كما ينبغي جلال وجهك وعظيم سلطانك وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله وصفيه من خلقه وخليله بلغ الرسالة وأدى الأمانة ونصح الأمة وكشف الله به الغمة وجاهد في سبيل ربه حتى أتاه اليقين اللهم ارزه عنا وعن والدينا وعن الإسلام والمسلمين خير ما جازيت به نبيا عن قومه ورسولا عن أمته اللهم أحينا على سنته وتوفنا على ملته وأوردنا حوضه واسقنا من يده الشريفة شربة هنيئة لا نظم بعدها أبدا الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر لا إله إلا الله الله أكبر الله أكبر وإله الحمد العين مبارك to all of you I really enjoy uh, Eid especially when it falls the weekend uh, so that the khutbah can go as long as we want and I have a timer here, so we're not going to go beyond two hours. So, <laughs> As simple, inshallah, try to make it as simple as possible. Just a quick reflection and a reminder. The reflection on Surah Al-Qadr, which we all memorize, إِنَّا أَنْزَلْنَاهُ فِي لَيْلَةِ الْقَدْرِ وَمَا أَدْرَاكَ مَا لَيْلَةُ الْقَدْرِ لَيْلَةُ الْقَدْرِ خَيْرٌ مِنْ أَلْفِ شَهْرِ To the end of the surah. And I think there are two key words in this beautiful surah. One is inna anzalnahu, and the other is khayrum min alf shahr. We know that this night is a night of prestige, night of power, night of importance, of standing or rank, great value, qadr. But it seems that our attention always goes to the second key word, khayrum min alf shahr. And we pay less attention to the first keyword, inna anzalna. And this perhaps makes us forget why this night has been made or has become a very special night. It has become a special night simply because our Quran was revealed in it. This Quran that has great value and importance came in this night, so this night became a night of importance and value and honor. That's why this night has become Laylatul Qadr. And this Quran of great Qadr came to a prophet of a great Qadr. The seal of the prophets, Khatamul Anbiya wal Mursaleen, alayhi salatu wa salam. And with this Quran, with this way of life, he, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, gave life to this Ummah, turned this Ummah from Ummah that has no Qadr has no strength or value into a nation of Qadr that has become the best Ummah not because of their race not because of the language they speak but simply because they were truthful, faithful to the Quran and the leadership that led based on the guidance of Al-Quran so it's the Quran that gives Qadr to this Ummah and with this ummah were truthful and sincere in following the leadership that leads based on the guidance of Al-Quran has become an ummah of Qadr. Great transformation happened to this ummah. All observers, almost all historians agree that Islam brought a tremendous transformation to this ummah. Even Bernard Lewis in his book Islamic Revolution um, said something uh, about this, admitting this fact. So reducing Laylatul Qadr into only six hours a year is not the right approach. Rather, for those who are seeking Qadr, if this Ummah really wants to regain its Qadr, its honor, its dignity, then it has to go back to the source of this Qadr, which exists at all times and places. Quran is still there. Whether people follow it or not, its Qadr, its importance, is there. It does not go anywhere. The Quran is still fresh, as fresh as it was revealed yesterday. And the Ummah is there. But the Ummah lost its Qadr. And I don't have to talk so much about this. It's not dead. But it suffers the illness of ignorance and disunity and, and suffering from leaders who have no Qadr are not leading based on the guidance of Al-Quran. It seems that leadership is a tremendous problem in the Muslim Ummah today. The Manhaj, the Quran, 
way of life, the guidance is there, the ummah is there, and leadership is what's missing. Leadership that, uh, we have leadership, but we have corrupt leadership in the Muslim world. Leadership that competes not on who will serve the best interests of his own people, but they compete in who can stay longer in power and who will be successful in passing this power to his children. And instead of working with other Muslim nations, they are competing in serving the interests of en the enemies of this Ummah. And Masjid al-Aqsa is still occupied, more than 60 years now, 50 years. And the occupiers are getting stronger, and the occupied are still suffering after 50 years, and 50 Laylatul Qadr. And 50 lazy dua, I would say. No one would dispute that Rasulullah sallallahu and his companions and Ahlul Bayt are the best worshippers. That's why the Sunnah of the Prophet is to make i'tikaf in the last 10 days and nights in Ramadan. For what? You know, the only reason is to seek Laylatul Qadr, not to miss Laylatul Qadr. But they're extremely active before and after. They are, don't prepare a long wish list and believing that if you make this dua in Laylatul Qadr, everything will be fine. Dua is important, don't get me wrong. We have to seek Layat al-Qadr and follow the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ, but not only on the 27th night. It's not only the last 10 days that we focus on one single night. It's our tradition. The 27th night here in this community, and I'm sure in many other communities, is the busiest night of the entire year. That's good. We should continue to do this. But that's not the end of the Sunnah of the Prophet. The Sunnah is to make Ajikaf seek Layat al-Qadr, but the Sunnah also is to follow the divine guidance that made this night Laylatul Qadr. And this, this Ummah, the Ummah of Al Qadr. These three elements are extremely important Quran, the leadership, sincere leadership, believe in this Quran and the guidance in this Quran, and people who are willing to follow this guidance of Al-Qur'an that makes it the best ummah of Rijat Finnas, you are the best ummah produced for mankind, as example for all mankind. When you follow this Qadr, or you follow this book of Qadr, you will become an ummah of Qadr. Islam came to provide two main things. One is a worldview, aqidah, faith, belief, set of belief and also came to regulate human behavior. That's what we call Sharia. Fasting in the month of Ramadan is part of it. That came to make us better human beings. And now if we really want to have Qadr, then we have to go back to the source of Qadr that exists every day and every night. Now, um, is the Quran relevant today to us? I'm raising this question for us all to think about, and I cannot promise you that I will give you um, a simple answer to how to answer this question. Is the Quran relevant? Aside from the fact that we all believe Quran is the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that is faith. Is the Quran relevant to us? Can we take the Quran with us wherever we go? This is not to apply Quran Mus'haf app in your our smartphone, which is good, it keeps the Quran with us at all times, we have access to the Quran wherever we go in our smartphone. But I mean, how can we take the Quran to our workplace, to our neighborhood, to our school? How to understand the Quran in the light of our very context? It's very problematic. And I am not pessimistic, but we, as the physicians, say that the first step to heal um, an illness is to diagnose it, to know what's what's the problem. Is Al-Quran relevant to us today? Do we from time to time go back to Al-Quran to see what Allah subhanahu wants me to do in my particular situation? Yes, we are living as a religious minority in this country. And yes, there are plenty of challenges ahead of us. And yes, we should and we do make a lot of du'as. But something is missing which is how to really, not only to read and to do Khatm al-Qur'an, which is good, but how to implement al-Qur'an 
into our life because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us this guidance for those who have taqwa and iman but how could our youth in their school you know in, in, in college how can they answer tough questions how can we mean how can they maintain their identity how could they be proud of Islam and 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 they, they feel comfortable talking about their tradition and their religion and what Al-Quran provides, not only for Muslims, but the entire humanity. It seems, Wallahu A'lam, that sometimes w the way we, pr we present Islam, even within ourselves, our children, we in schools and so on, that we are ignoring the fact that, that some of the teaching we are providing is making Islam irrational and irrelevant. Maybe our children are not saying this to us, but I'm sure this is what goes on in the mind of many of them. So it's a great challenge for us. Some actually think that Islam is a historic book that was good work in the seventh century, but how can it work now? It's part of our faith and belief that Quran is, the teaching of the Quran is valid at all times and places, but it takes human mind to understand, read Al-Quran, and also read their own context and understand what's going on around the world. But when we present Islam from a particular point of view that has been made centuries ago in a totally different context, we are making a huge mistake. We are making a big disservice to the beautiful book that we call Al-Quran and to the religion of Al-Islam. And this is the case, honestly, when we talk about many things like women in Islam, gender relations, uh, Muslim, non-Muslim relationship. I sometimes read books that have been written centuries ago, and I, I can tell that it's very rigid, very un-Islamic. And this is not what Rasulullah used to teach. Yet, some of us hold these books or interpretations as holy as the Quran itself. Quran became a secondary book to these opinions has been made sometime and somewhere. Again, brothers and sisters, it is a problem that we have to really uh, think about collectively. And I'm not here to suggest that we should be liberal or conservative. We are not to be liberal or conservative. We, we just want to be Muslims. People are truthful to their book and truthful to the country in which they live. And they are trying to uh, be faithful to both. Because Islam does not require a particular set of, of systems to function in. Islam works in any context, in any context. Islam does not demand that you either apply 100% of Islam or there's no Islam at all. If this was the case, Islam would have never reached to all of us. But as um, Dr. Omar Abdullah says um, rightly that Islam in China looks very Chinese. Right? And Islam in Africa is very, uh, very relevant. Islam in Africa is an African uh, religion. What we are facing this big challenge here is Islam and American religion. We Muslims said, of course, Islam is a universal religion. And we are always proud of the fact that our community is a very diverse community. What I'm suggesting here is that we have to be honest. We have to be sincere. We have to really make tough choices who we are. Are we a community of immigrants and South Asian, but in particular, community? That we claim that our doors are open for everybody, but practically we are saying Urdu speakers only. We are not saying this, but when we do Khatm Quran in Urdu and we give speech and Tafsir Quran in Urdu, you are saying to non Urdu speakers, we are sorry, you are out. You are not welcome. You are not allowed. It's a big mistake, not only in this masjid. It seems that some do not still realize that we are living in a place called the United States of America. I like this uh, tradition of, 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 of Chandras, right? Huh? I just, I heard so much about it, but I asked someone, what, what is it? And it's a beautiful thing, it's beautiful to have the community coming together, men and women and children and enjoying uh, um, the last day of Ramadan and uh, but again think about it 
when someone reads an email that comes that this day we have Chandra, if he does not know what Chandra is, he immediately thinks that it's for someone else, it's not for me. I don't know what it is. And but if people actually come, they will like, they will love it. It's it's a beautiful thing. But we need to give it a different name. There's nothing haram in this. Give it a different name. It's not a Quranic term. The Prophet ﷺ never said it. So we can change it here. We call it Eid celebration or, or pre-Eid celebration or the end of Ramadan celebration. We can find any name that makes it Islamic and American and, and traditional, beautiful tradition. But again, this is how, in fact, Rasulullah ﷺ told us, beautiful hadith, beautiful. And I just we need to, 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 to think about it. He said, if you are three, it's inappropriate for two people to talk to each other and exclude the third person. Think about it. If you are sitting with two of your friends or family members and they are whispering to each other and you are excluded, how would you feel? It, the same thing applies. If you, are, if you are speaking loudly, but you are speaking a language that the other person does not understand, it's very inappropriate. It's as if you are saying that you, you, you are out. Just say it. Get out of this. And sometimes people think that they're talking about him or her, so that, that's why they are. So we have to be mindful that there are plenty of people. If we are truthful to the fact that we, are, we take pride in the fact that we are um, uh, a diverse community, then we need to understand nobody should be excluded. Everybody should be welcome. We are living in America, right? And we have to keep this in mind in every activities we are doing. Our masjid is supposed to be open not only for Muslims, but for also for non-Muslims. Believe me, many actually come. I, I've, I've been told that in, in this khutbah, um, this priest was there, and this pastor came, and this uh, my neighbor came, and, and you know, like this gathering. Everybody is supposed to be welcomed here. Again, it's difficult to give a complete answer to how to make Al Quran relevant to our time, but we have to think together in how to really make our community inclusive and finally I just want to remind myself and brothers and sisters here with the beautiful hadith of the Prophet وسلم, perhaps a, a total, uh, kind of different uh, subject but just a reminder that I was reflecting on fasting in, in Ramadan and I found out that there are perhaps a general and a specific meaning of fasting the specific meaning fasting of Ramadan to abstain from eating and drinking an intimate relationship during the daytime but actually some took it further and they talk about the cost of fasting by abstaining from the pleasure of this dunya, not totally of course, but to take from this dunya what's sufficient for us. Because this dunya is very short. We have to understand that as if Rasulullah wants to draw this analogy between um, the joy we have when we break our fasting we made it, and the joy we will experience, inshallah, when we meet with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When he said the hadith in Bukhari and Muslim, there are two joys for the believer, or the fasting person. One joy he or she will experience when they break their fasting, and the other joy will happen when they meet with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The similar thing to death is sleeping. When we sleep at night, it's kind of similar. And, and, and the similar thing to resur resurrection, the day of judgment, when we wake up in the morning. And it seems to me Rasulullah wants us also to draw this attention, this, to draw this analogy or parallel between fasting when you practice this self-restraint. But you, are, you know, you're going to enjoy it later on. And when Maghrib comes, we enjoy it. Why? We just sit and wait until Maghrib comes. And similarly, the real perfect life is not here. It is there when we will really, inshallah, enjoy the uh, reward of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Imam Sheikh Nabulsi actually made a wonderful point when he made, when he said that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives people in this dunya ata, the gift of test. Some people are more intelligent than others. Some are uh, wealthier than others. Some are more beauti beautiful than others. Some are more famous than others. There are different gifts. Everybody's given something, right? We always want to get all these things together. We want to be wealthy and beautiful, famous, and so on and so forth. But this is not going to happen in this dunya. Someone may be a, a pious and righteous person, 
but not very smart. And someone could be very wealthy, but not very healthy, or his children are not obedient. But the real beautiful people and the real wealthy people, the real successful people, are the people upon whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be pleased with. When they stand before Allah and they, Allah tell them, now go to Jannah. Some people in this dunya will be extremely wealthy, but will be very poor, very successful in this dunya, will be big losers in the hereafter. Beautiful in this dunya, be very ugly in the hereafter. This is what Rasulullah said, Ala rubba kasiyatin fi dunya ariyatin yawm al qiyamah. Perhaps some will be well dressed in this dunya, but will be naked in the day of judgment. Ila waqa'atil waqi'ah, laysa waqa'atiha kadiba, khafidatun rafi'ah. The day of judgment, when it happens, some will go up and some will go down. So we need actually to think about this, that we cannot get everything in this dunya, but inshallah we can get it all when we break our fasting from the love of this dunya, about which Rasulullah sallallahu said, hadith in Sahih Muslim, this life or the life of this world compared to the life after is as if one of you were to put his finger in the ocean and takes it out again. Then compare the amount of water that remains on his finger to the water that remains in the ocean. And whatever thing you people have been given is only for the enjoyment of this world. And what is with Allah is better and more lasting. So will you not use reason We just need to be people of reason and think about it. And finally, um, the month of Ramadan is known to be the month of victory and uh, we always talk about win the war against ourselves. And uh, we've heard so many times that the victory of the Badr, battle of Badr took place in, in Ramadan and then the opening of Mecca and then Islam came to Andalusia at the year 98, um, Mu'tariq ibn Ziyad uh, in Ramadan and also the Battle of Ain Jalut, when Muslims actually defeated the Mongols. And, um, and in 2017, actually, some said it's the month of victory because um, uh, Fadl uh, Fakhr Zaman and Muhammad Amir brought the ICC champion to Pakistan. <laughs> so congratulations for Pakistanis for winning this uh, World Cup. And there is another reason for them to be happy today. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept from all of you. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive all our sins and accept our dua and our prayer. إن الله ملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما صليت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم وبارك على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما باركت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم في العالمين إنك حميد مجيد We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this blessed day to accept from all of us and to forgive all our sins and to bless our families and to bless this beautiful community May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us from the evil of ourselves and from the evil of our enemies. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bring peace to our hearts, to our homes, to our community. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to enjoy more Ramadans to come. Eid Mubarak. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept from all of us. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.